Celebrating 46 years on the air, award-winning Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, despite all the moisture, the Mississippi River still low. But in another part of the country, shipping by water the preferred way to move goods around. In Southern Gardening, a poignant and heartfelt final goodbye to a retiring Gary Bachman. And in our feature, an unusual partnership in Colorado puts ranchers on land and students in classrooms. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Zach Ashmore. And I'm Mike Russell. Great to have you with us again here on Farm Week for our first broadcast of 2023. In recent weeks, we focused on the water level of the Mississippi River, dramatically lower than in years past. With all the rain we've had lately, you'd expect that problem to be over, but that's not quite the case. Peter Tubbs has the story. The water level of the Mississippi River has improved in recent weeks, but the river remains too low for normal shipping volumes. Draft depths for barges along most of the river are down 30% compared to normal levels. River depths in the lower Mississippi River have improved since record lows in October, but water levels between St. Louis and Cairo have deteriorated. The river level at Memphis neared the minimum operational limit in October, but has risen 16 feet in the last six weeks. Some barge operators have reduced the number of tows by half, and those tows include a reduced number of barges due to width restrictions on the river. Barges are often loaded at only 75% of capacity. Recent rains in the lower watershed have raised river levels by up to 10 feet in sections of the channel, but the long-term prognosis is for lower than average levels to be the norm until the drought is broken. Cape Girardeau, Missouri sits 50 miles upriver from Cairo, Illinois, and is accustomed to dealing with wide swings in the depth of the Mississippi River. For our area, the last major drought occurred in 2012, so 10 years ago. So in between then and now, both of which were record-setting drought uh, disasters. Um, we here in Cape Girardeau have seen several record-setting flooding issues. While it has experienced some economic loss from the lower river levels on a reduced basis for grains raised in the region, it has recently experienced damage to its infrastructure due to drought conditions. In October, shifting soil broke a 14-inch water main, which placed the entire city under a boil order. So record-setting drought, Record-setting flood, record-setting flood, now record-setting drought. That takes a toll on, on every city, every industry, every business. And it's just not very well seen. It's not obvious, but there's a lot of expense there. The supply chain challenges of recent years actually sparked some creative responses, resulting in new ways for goods to get from one place to another. Shipping from the coasts has always been popular, but the Great Lakes region has turned into a new favorite. Laura Weber Davis has that story. Since 2020, backups at ports in the Atlantic and Pacific coasts have left cargo ships stacked up, waiting to unload in the U.S. And rising fuel costs, congested highways, and a shortage of truck drivers are also creating headaches for businesses wanting to get their goods in or out of the U.S. interior. And they're looking for other options. Will Friedman is president and CEO of the Port of Cleveland. The companies that need to move these goods, either as a manufacturer or as a retailer, um, they're pretty desperate. And so, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. And they're now asking much more so than previously, why can't we get a ship into Cleveland and just avoid all that gridlock at, at those big ports? But rerouting cargo from congested coastal ports to Cleveland isn't so simple. On the Great Lakes, freighters mainly move bulk cargoes like iron ore, grain, and coal that are loaded loose into the ship's holds. But globally, most cargo is moved in containers. Great Lakes freighters and the ports they visit aren't really set up to handle large shipments in containers, but that may be changing. 
In 2014, the Port of Cleveland saw an opportunity and developed the first container service on the Great Lakes to handle import and export cargo. In partnership with Dutch company Spleethof, they created the Cleveland Europe Express with a regularly scheduled route between Cleveland and Antwerp. The Peyton Lynn Sea, a small container ship, travels out of the St. Lawrence Seaway and across the Atlantic. The trip takes approximately 14 days, with a few days in each port to unload. And the opportunity to move other types of cargo on the Great Lakes in containers is providing new cost-effective transportation solutions for some shippers. It actually does help with cost for a ship to come all the way into Cleveland because the longer you keep cargo on the water, the more economical it is. It's also a greener form of transportation. And according to Friedman, shipping through Cleveland avoids the delays that can happen at congested ocean ports. And Cleveland isn't the only Great Lakes port that's looking to expand its container shipping. The port of Duluth Superior is the largest port on the Great Lakes by tonnage, including the twin ports of Duluth, Minnesota and Superior, Wisconsin. And it's making waves in container shipping. Deb DeLuca is the executive director of the Duluth Seaway Port Authority. From here, you can reach major markets such as the Twin Cities, Fargo, Des Moines, also Milwaukee, and even down to Chicago. So um, it, it, from, a, from a logistics standpoint, that's very attractive. Great Lakes ports are also looking into new options like a feeder service where containers are offloaded in bigger ports and transported along the St. Lawrence Seaway in smaller vessels, similar to what is done in Europe. Both the ports of Cleveland and Duluth expect to move more shipping containers in the coming year. December 31st was the last day on the job for our popular Southern Gardening host, Dr. Gary Bachman. Before he sailed off into the sunset, though, Gary crafted one last story for us, a treasure trove of creative clips from several of his stories over the years. You're sure to remember a few of these. We call them stand-ups. Here's Gary's goodbye to you. In one's career, like gardening, there's a season for everything and the time has come for me to retire. As I prepare for the next chapter, I was reminiscing about all the fun we've had on Southern Gardening. Here's a few of my favorite moments. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman for Southern Gardening. Shishigashira, woo! Valentine's Day produced a couple of memorable impersonations. I don't normally watch television for advice on love, but when I do, it's Southern Gardening. My friend, the Southern Gardener. Wow, thanks, Godfather. I even discussed plant science as the mad plant scientist. Your celery master. Great Scott Marty, you're a genius. And who doesn't like the fall season when the naked ladies are in the garden? Which, by the way, is Southern Gardening's most popular segment on YouTube. Who knew? I've had the chance to show off my horticulture wizard skills. When crepe murder's involved, it's time to call CSI Horticulture Unit. We even looked at the struggle with good and evil in the garden. Oh. You're right, let's do this. We've had guest hosts like my bloom buddy, Puff the Magic Snapdragon. Never mind. He's horticulturist Gary Bachman for Southern Gardening. Cut! Great face! Great job! Yeah. Yeah. Now don't worry, I'll still be around because the horticulture never stops. Let's stay in touch on my social media channels. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I appreciate you joining me through the years on Southern Gardening.
we're really going to miss him, aren't we? Absolutely, we will. By the way, Southern Gardening will live on in a couple of ways. First, as Gary himself alluded to in my interview with him, there will be Southern Gardening 3.0, someone new to step into his shoes and carry on with the segment. And second, in the meantime, we'll repeat some of Gary's great stories from the last few years, so the tradition lives on. We'll take a break right here, but don't go away. Coming up on our Farm Week feature, a unique land lease program in Colorado with an added benefit. It's a program more than 150 years old that encourages a healthy relationship between ranchers who lease the land and believe it or not, the state itself. Here's the kicker, the money that comes in from more than 200, 2,000 such leases supports state-of-the-art schools in rural areas of Colorado. Trusting the ranchers, coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith, and their right to make their own plans and arrive at their own decisions, and their ability and power to enlarge their lives and plan for the happiness of those they love. I believe that education, of which extension work is an essential part, is basic in stimulating individual initiative, self-determination, and leadership. That these are the keys to democracy, and that people, when given facts they understand, will act not only in their self-interest, but also in the interest of society. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. in people and their hopes, their aspirations, and their faith. I believe in intellectual freedom to search for and present the truth without bias and with courteous tolerance toward the views of others. I believe that education is a lifelong process and the greatest university is the home. That my success as a teacher is proportional to those qualities of mind and spirit that give me welcome entrance to the homes of the families I serve. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. Now, though, time for the market report. No big surprises coming into the new year. That's right, Mike. No uh, big instability so far, other than weather and, of course, the Ukraine war. And we'll get into it. But first, the numbers evenly split this week. We'll see who made the biggest impact. And then, in our road report, weather, the big talk, and it's not all bad news. And finally, December's Catalan feed report. How do we look compared to last year? So, markets evenly split last week on the ups and downs, row crops getting the better end of it. Let's take a look. Last week's biggest loss, lumber down $13, the price now a fraction of what it was at the end of December last year by exactly $777. Last week's biggest gain, soybeans up nearly 40 cents. The reason, like most row crops, weather, harvest, international pressures, and ultimately stocks as well. That isn't to say we're in trouble. Price is still lower than June 22 when they got up to $17 a bushel. With all that said, in our row report, we dig into the three main commodities we follow, wheat, corn, and soybeans. So, how's the beginning of 2023 looking for them? In short, not too bad. Market analyst Don Rose says weather the biggest factor affecting prices. That and the harvest from Australia and South America. Their harvest is during our winter, and that gives us a post-harvest rally. Well, I think if you look at these markets, a lot of them, including the livestock, was all about a lot of weather. And, you know, in a thin market, you can move a market pretty aggressively. Um, but when a lot of it, we're watching the weather in Argentina, it hasn't really changed a lot. So we added risk premium. We had uh, back to the weather. We had uh, transportation slow down. Very often when you get your first big storm like this, um, transportation slows down and you add some weather premium to the market, 
corn, soybeans, uh, wheat with a winter kill because consumption goes up by the livestock. The big thing that you have on the wheat market is Russia continues to sell wheat below the world market on rallies, but uh, the thing that really brought us to the upside was the winter concern. The fact that Australia uh, had a bigger crop than we thought, they pressed us to the downside. Their harvest is basically behind us, so we're getting that post-harvest rally. And we know Argentina had a sl uh, smaller crop. They're about 91% uh, harvested. So I think it was a relief rally from the southern uh, hemisphere. And then we had issues here in the north. So uh, going forward, the wheat is probably going to be a switch to what happens with our crop in uh, North America as we get into the spring. We're in a, a really tough resistance. We go to 685 on Friday. Every nickel up is going to be tough, and anything happens with improved weather in Argentina, and I think uh, the market comes under a lot of pressure pretty darn quick. Our ethanol uh, consumption uh, production is uh, under some pressure. Profitability just isn't there. Our exports on corn are down 47% uh, versus a year ago, so we don't have a uh, it's all about the supply problem that when we talk about the demand, you've got a real issue with the corn. Well, the December corn, uh, you know, the same thing is coming under some uh, pressure. It's all about what's going to happen with Argentine weather gave us a little pop to the upside. Um, they're what, about 67% uh, planted, about 15% of their crop is good to excellent uh, versus 58% a year ago. So it's a problem with Argentina, June, July, they'll have their basically their harvest. We got within 20 cents of contract highs on November soybeans, uh, just over 30 cents away from contract high on the uh, March soybeans. So uh, you've had an awful lot of risk premium into the market. It's gonna be a dangerous uh, three day weekend because if the weather pattern changes at all, um, a lot of premium comes back out of this market. If you look at it from a producer standpoint, look at where we're really sitting. You know, you're sitting basically close to contract highs, areas that have been very hard to get to over history with an economy that is still very much shaky. With Brazil that probably has a, a record crop, probably makes up for the loss in Argentina. Um, the government, I just want to tell you about soybeans, where we're really at. Our carryout's running 220 now, is basically 270 last year, 250 the year before that. Um, so our carryouts aren't a lot different the last three years, but uh, government's forecasting $14 this year. Last year, 1330, but where I'm going, it was 1080 two years ago. Uh, carryouts aren't that much different. We got the same thing going on in corn. It's have we moved to a new level for what reason? In the cattle markets, prices still up. Looks like a good year for cattle. In the final cattle on feed report of 2022, we got a good look into why prices are what they are. In short, cattle on feed down 3%, which means fewer cattle, which means higher prices. Here's what it said. Cattle and calves on feed for the slaughter market in the United States for feed lots with capacity of 1,000 or more head totaled 11.7 million head on December 1st, 2022. The inventory was 3% below December 1st, 2021. Placements in feedlots during November totaled 1.93 million head, 2% 2 below 2021. Net placements were 1.87 million head. Marketings of fed cattle during November totaled 1.89 million head, 1% 1 above 2021. Marketings were the highest for November since the series began in 1996. Other disappearance totaled 57,000 head during November, 7% 7 below 2021. And that's it for a deeper look into the markets. Hope you all had a great holiday. Looks like the markets did. We're in for an interesting year with weather and conflict still affecting prices. Mike? Thank you, Zach. In our feature this week, an unusual land lease program in Colorado. As you'll see, it's unique in that the program is designed to cultivate the relationship between the ranchers and the state. And every dollar of the lease money produces an added benefit. John Torpy has the story. The Rocky Mountains make a picturesque backdrop for the daily routine of Nick Trainer, a fifth generation cattle rancher based in Watkins, Colorado. When he began building his own ranch a decade ago, Trainer adopted a mindset that included holistic grazing. His dedication to the concept helped him find a unique leasing opportunity designed to help the land, his ranching operations, and schools across the state of Colorado. I lease several private 
branches getting started. Um, and then when this lease came up, it was big enough. I was scattered around on several different smaller leases. This one um, was big enough that I could move my family here and, and we could ranch full time. Trainer went after the opportunity to lease land from the Colorado State Land Board. The state agency owns roughly 3 million acres and is tasked by the Colorado legislature with leasing parcels of land to agricultural and energy interests. The length of the lease varies depending on the specific type of agreement. The rates are lower than private land leases, but higher than the amount federal government agencies, the Bureau of Land Management and Department of Forestry among them, charge for grazing. Trainer leases land on the 24,000 acre Lowry Ranch, located 30 minutes east of Denver. His lease allows him to graze 400 to 900 cattle annually, depending on the breed. The way this lease is structured, you know, we've got a really good inventory on the grass and, you know, when, when drought events are coming, like right now, we're already in conversations about how those numbers need to be adjusted. Um, and, you know, we talk through the problem and, and come up with a, with a plan. Rather than a normal tenant and landlord arrangement, leases with the state of Colorado encourage the establishment of working relationships between the lessor and the lessee. My main responsibility is to do inspections on our agriculture leases, which is probably my favorite part of my job. That's where I get to go out and meet with our lessees and get a tour through ranches and farms throughout Colorado. And, and what Rachel else. Turner is the district um, manager for the North Central District for the Colorado State Land Board. Turner's office encompasses 480,000 acres of Centennial State landscape. As district manager, I do a lot of other things. So I work with oil and gas and renewable energies, um, work a lot with the Forest Service recently, and anything and everything that comes in. The Colorado State Land Board contains six districts with a designated manager for each. Currently, the Colorado State Land Board has roughly 7,000 active leases, with over 2,000 devoted to agriculture. Turner notes, the lease agreements encourage teamwork between state land board officials and the farmers and ranchers of Colorado with a shared purpose of caring for the land. We really rely on our agriculture lessees. They are the knowledge base. They know that land better than anybody else. Um, like I said, they, many of them live next door or have been on the land since, well, some of them before statehood. For Trainer, leasing with the Colorado State Land Board has been a major benefit for his operation. It's more of a partnership. Um, and that's what makes it work. And, you know, that was one of the really appealing things to me whenever they put the RFP out there was, you know, it, it was structured correctly from the get-go that, hey, we're going to work together to meet these common goals. And, you know, by and large, and I think they'd say the same thing, it's been a huge success. Many lessees have deep family roots in Colorado, with some lease agreements stretching back decades. That dedication to the land, coupled with the rancher's devotion to community, helps the state land board with the other half of its unique mission. One of the biggest benefits of working with the state, the rent goes directly back to the school kids, and that's one huge benefit that our lessees really appreciate because they know it's going back into their community and it's being used for good. Since 1876, Funds accrued from state land board leases have been allocated to the state's Building Excellent Schools Today, or BEST program. Through the Colorado Department of Education, school districts can apply for BEST grants to help offset costs for construction projects and school improvements. To date, the BEST program has awarded over $1.6 billion in grants. The nearly century and a half year old program has been labeled a lifeline for rural communities like Brush, Colorado, which was searching for a way to replace two aging schools with a limited amount of resources. 2016, we went to our voters and said, we need a, essentially a $60 million middle school, high school, and the state will pay for half of it. Would you pay for the other half? With the funds from the BEST program, the Brush Community School District was able to build a state-of-the-art combined middle and high school. The grant also helped the district find additional funds to provide new avenues of learning for students. You know, there are a lot of vocations out there 
that don't require a typical four-year or six-year college degree. And so we, we were very intentional about our what's called CTE, career and technical ed programs, and making sure that we're providing our students opportunities in as many different areas as possible. Open in 2019, the new Brush School boasts a fully certified USDA kitchen and multiple skilled labor and technical platforms. The school aims to help the community thrive while educating the next generation. Whatever we can do, we need to do, because otherwise we are unintentionally failing the next generation that's going to be taking care of you and me and, and running our world. Trainer, Wilson and Turner all agree that whether you are a cattle rancher leasing state land, a state land board employee taking care of the land, or an educator striving to provide the best learning experience, the entire community wins in the end. It's not only today's school children, but we're properly managing land for future generations as well. Something you don't hear too much about farmers and ranchers getting along with the government. That's right. Well, next time on Farm Week, something we still hear all too much about, truckers. In case you're one of the few who hadn't heard, there's a serious shortage of truck drivers. Many of them serve the ag world. Of course, truckers move billions of tons of freight every year, generating a mountain of money and revenue. We'll meet drivers who got into the business, and now they're easing on down the road. On the other hand, solving that shortage isn't as easy as you think. What a long, strange trip it still is. That's next time on Farm Week. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. See you next week. Thanks for watching. Happy New Year.